My name's Adele Onyango and welcome to another episode of Legally Clueless. No, seriously, I have no clue what I'm doing, but I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one. Hey you, welcome to episode 109 of Legally Clueless. Thank you so much for rocking with this podcast. If this is your first ever episode, by the way, welcome to the fam. New audio episodes go out every Monday. Video episodes, which I'll get into a little later, go out every Friday and you can join. Oh yeah, you can join our online family on Instagram at Legally Clueless Podcast. And on Twitter, just use the hashtag Legally Clueless. I will find you. That sounds like a threat. (laughs) But I say it with all the love. I'm really excited about the story in this episode. I sat on it for a while because I was trying to clean up the audio. I don't think I really succeeded, but it's audible. And the reason I'm sharing it is because it's such an important story. And, And I just... I loved connecting with the storyteller. His name is Adrian. Listen to this. So I met her at a friend's place. She was actually Muslim and Pakistani as well. Actually, her family was very... When they learned that we were dating, it was a huge problem. So here she was dating a black man. And her family did not take it very well until there was a day I was walking home. Just as I was about to turn into my street, her three brothers were there and yeah, they pulled out a gun and I was like, wait, what? Her mom and her sisters and her brothers were there and it was a huge scene. They called the police. I, I, I don't even know why they called the police because it didn't even make sense. Let me just say that I have not had a serious relationship since her. So I do apologize. <laughs> I really tried. I I think I recorded this story in early 2020. And because of COVID, obviously, I recorded it virtually. We were in the middle of COVID when I recorded this, I believe. So I really tried to clean up the audio, sent it to a producer friend of mine as well. I think it's kind of audible, but I also believe I have an issue (laughs) when it comes to recording people with like (laughs) basses. But anyway, the story is coming up a little later in this episode and we'll talk a bit more about it then. I really hope you're having a... What do I hope for you? I wanted to say a good start, but I don't know. We're just living in such hectic times. So uh, what is the word that I wish for you? I think maybe calm and like internal peace. I hope that's something that you're experiencing because it's something I'm not. (laughs) But I'll get to that. I'll get to that. First, I do want to say thank you for watching the first ever Legally Clueless video series episode. I didn't back out. I didn't give in to self-doubt. The episode went out on Friday. Yes, last Friday. And I opened up the Legally Clueless YouTube channel as well. Didn't back out of that either. And yeah, I'm really excited about it. I was watching the episode as though I wasn't in the room while we were recording (laughs) I was just like, oh my God, this is so awesome. So I'm really proud of the work that we've done. We being first the storyteller. Her name is Captain Smiles. Her story is so powerful. Oh my God, if you've not checked out that episode, go out and check it out. I'm also thankful to Mudoni Gitau. She's been on the podcast before, actually. Yeah, she was in episode 103. So she did the set for the Legally Clueless video series. It's so beautiful. And of course, I love it because it's yellow. And the filming and editing and all things visual was done by Ronin Productions, my very good friend, Roy. And yeah, I'm very proud of the work that we did. So if you haven't checked it out, I'll put a link to that episode in the description of this podcast. I'm so thankful I didn't back out because it feels so good to achieve something and to have built this space for myself especially after resigning from such a huge media company and just I didn't have many naysayers around me because I do protect my space a lot but every now and then I would interact with like a naysayer so it feels good to have created the space and to see it growing <gasps> It's just magical. Anyway, other than that, this week has been way very hectic. So initially around Monday, I was feeling a bit like mentally exhausted. So what I was calling it was pandemic exhaustion. Is that what I was 
pandemic fatigue i'd coined something <laughs> i actually just thought i was feeling not motivated etc cetera, etc cetera, because just we're in a third wave and the fear that comes with that and the anxiety that comes with that and every other day on social media there's like rest in peace or raise funds for this burial and that person who's in hospital obviously it's also added irritation that our government is just failing massively when it comes to this whole issue and so I assumed that all of that got to me so I was like hmm, maybe like last year I had like my coping mechanisms down to a T but this year maybe I'm just man it's been over a year it's exhausting but what was worrying for me is that the first thought I was having every morning was very dark I would not be not excited but I would not even be like ah, a new day I'll just be like oh fuck not a new day like I wish I could just keep sleeping and escape it all and the weird thing is that there was nothing terrible happening in my life there was the excitement of the video series there was good things <laughs> like there was nothing terrible happening in my life but I was having and maybe those thoughts actually started before Monday because then later on in the week I reached out to my therapist and I was just like I keep on waking up feeling like this and it's darker thoughts than I'm used to or like I've not experienced it like this and with this consistency I wouldn't say the thoughts I think what was scary was that the thoughts were not scaring me like they were very rational as to why I didn't want to wake up so I reached out to my therapist because obviously from the outside looking in and she's just been monitoring everything I've been telling her over the past couple of weeks she was just like it started back in March I was like how did it start so around my mom's, actually not much, like in Feb. Yeah, in Feb. And I'm cognizant of it from March. My mom's, I don't know why we call it death anniversary, but death anniversary. This was very weird for me because it was probably one of the first ever death anniversaries where I was feeling guilty for still being alive and moving on with my life and like living. I felt guilty about that. And that was a bit overwhelming. Anyway, so it's apparently even the thoughts that I'm having now are still linked from there. Like it's just been building up, building up. It doesn't help that we're in an environment that is so full of fear, grief, anxiety, and pandemic fatigue. <laughs> that doesn't help. But the spark of these thoughts that I'm having started from Feb into March and now April. So I'm doing all that I need to do <laughs> to cope. This morning was so much better. I woke up feeling so good. Earlier on in the week, I had a really good heart to heart with Fal, my partner. And we were just talking about like death and grief. It was such a vulnerable conversation and that left me feeling so good. Had similar conversations with two other friends and obviously that really helped. But it's also like reminded me of two things. One, I need to extend grace to myself. Like be graceful, be kind with myself. These are not normal times. A, B, the sources of trauma in my life are really tough. So I need to acknowledge that and be graceful and kind with myself not not shit on myself if I'm having a hard time navigating them so it reminded me of those two things which I'm trying to practice every day okay so let's jump into the song of the week now that I've just dumped every heavy thing that I'm dealing with on you I'm so sorry <laughs> ah, um this song I really love okay not only because I have the hugest crush on this woman, Janelle Monet. Oh my God. But the song is so beautiful. Like the arrangement, everything about it is, and, and the, the lyrics. <sighs> ah, I love it so much. Um, and it took me a while to actually love it. Because when it first came out as part of the album Dirty Computer, I wasn't too sure about it. But now, ah, I think I play it like every day. So the name of the song is Don't Judge Me. I'll put a link to the song in the description of this episode. Please make sure you check it out. And if I find time this week, I know I've been promising this forever. 
I will make a playlist of some of the songs I've shared with you on this podcast. I'll probably make it on Apple Music and Spotify so that you can just jam to them back to back to back. Okay, so let's jump into 100 African Stories. Adrian is the storyteller, a listener of the podcast. He reached out, sent a story demo, and then we set up a virtual recording. I really sat on this audio because I was not sure it was the best quality. I got a friend to try and clean it up, a friend who's a producer, to try and clean it up as well. It improved slightly, but I just feel like it's such an important story about dating or having a relationship with somebody of a different race or a different culture or even a different religion. A hundred African stories on Legally Clueless. Stories from Africa. My name is Adrian and I'm from Kenya. So uh, I met this person, this woman, in 2016, I had actually just finished my A level. So I met her at a friend's place. Uh, you know how you just go to your friend's place and you're going out to chill, to have some drinks, and then maybe you can make the club later. So we didn't actually speak much, but <laughs> yeah, I did check her out and eventually I got her number and, you know, we started speaking. And I learned that uh, she was actually Muslim and Pakistani as well. We just continued talking and interacting, getting to know each other better. Eventually, I discovered uh, that she had gone through sexual abuse. So we kind of built like a trauma bond, because that's something I'd also been through before. So we'd find each other together a lot, discussing the emotions we'd go through. Her family wasn't always the most supportive, and her abuser would frequently visit their place, so it would, it would constantly throw her off course. Yeah, let's say, let's say a few months, let's say like four months later, we started dating, although it was not, we just found ourselves in a space like, uh, are we dating now? <laughs> and you're like, oh yeah, yeah, this is, this is what people call dating. Okay. Yeah. This is, this is how we're going to do it. But I think the first week into this, into dating, she went out and she went out with her friends and I didn't have any issues with that. But she came back very, very drunk and she was calling me in the night. Uh, I think that should have been a fast red flag, but considering how young I was and uh, how inexperienced I was with relationships, because that was like my second relationship, I just I just didn't think much of it. But she came drunk and she was very very aggressive, very insulting, and yeah, it was a whole messy period. And I continued moving through life thinking that no matter what happens, uh, I have to protect this human being. I didn't actually realize this mentality until later on when I was looking back at it, but he was pretty much there all the time. I would excuse everything she would do or say based on the fact that, you know, she's going to save and her family is an interesting entity on its own. Actually, her family was very, when they learned that we were dating, it was a huge problem. What 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 I came to learn is in the Pakistani culture, they they prefer to marry between clans or something like it's either you're from the same clan or you're not. So uh, a lot of her elder sisters were like married to some first or second cousins. Um so she was expected to go down that road and Having the black sheep of that family, she didn't really want to go that direction at all. So here she was dating a black man <laughs> and her family did not take it very well. Uh, I would regularly get threats, you know. I never used to think much of them because anyway, as in, yes, I'm so used to hearing some dude saying, if she cast his tongue, like, if you hope, if you, if you do something to my sister, then, I'll end your life or something. But 
this one I didn't take that seriously until there was a day I was walking home and just as I was about to turn into my street, I had her three brothers were there and yeah, they pulled out a gun and I was like, wait, what? I didn't expect I was, yeah, I froze. I could not speak. The only thing I was telling them was like, I'll leave your sister, just don't kill me at all. And, you know, growing up, I really did enjoy romance movies. So something that I've always believed is love conquers all. Love conquers every single thing. And I went back to her and I was like, you know, despite everything that is happening, I believe that I love you and I want to spend the rest of my life with you. So despite what your family does, I will stick by your side. She didn't say anything that day. She was like, okay, it's okay. I'm sorry for my brothers and everything. But a few days later, she came and she was like, we have to end this. It's it's really, it's really not sticking well and my family is going to do something to you. And I was like, whatever love conquers all that's the that's the motto that we are going with right so we continued dating we'd regularly have like it would be once a month thing where she'd come and always be like you know we have to stop this and i was like no 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 we have to continue i think i, I also forgot to mention that this human being was four years older than me so when she met me technically it should have been legal <laughs> I was so engrossed in her that I felt that, you know, we definitely have, like, I have to marry this woman for the sake of, you know, protecting her. As, as, as we continued, things didn't really change. We just continued. In fact, I'd say over the turn of the relationship, it was like a whole downhill drive. We got to a point where she cheated, and I was like, um, okay, yeah. I still forgave her. I was like, you know, this is all, it's all being caused by the trauma that she went through. Those are the reasons why she's behaving this way. As time went on, I started feeling like she's not really in for it. And I would have these conversations with her where I'm like, uh, are you willing to fight this battle? And she was like, no, because you do not understand my culture and do not understand a thing a thing about my people and how, as in, if you did, you'd know that this is virtually impossible. So I took this as a challenge. I was like, okay, you want me to understand your culture? Okay. So I I decided that I'm going to go and meet as many people from her culture as possible. I was like, okay, introduce me to, you know, your friends. I'm going to be hanging out with them. And the ironic thing is every single person I spoke to regarding, you know, marrying her and all, they were like, ah, bruh, you know, you know, you can date her, but marrying her is a different ball game. It's not gonna happen and it's not gonna sit well with her parents. And I would always get pissed off at that comment of parents. I was like, why do they have such a massive say in who you spend your re the rest of your life with? So when we continued on with the relationship. She was diagnosed with cancer. So I, I would go with her for chemotherapy. So one day we went with her and Coincidentally, her father had a stroke that day. So we were in the same hospital and she was feeling really awful that she couldn't be by her dad's side because of chemo. We just met, you know, it was like a movie. We met in the corridor. So we were together and her mom and her sisters and her brothers were there and we were all looking at each other like what? And it was a huge scene. They called the police. They were like, uh, this is like, I, I, I don't even know why they called the police because it didn't even make sense because they were trying everything and anything to keep me away from her. Something that I didn't notice was how much of a toll this was all taking on her mental health. And uh, being the person that I am, I've always been interested in things of mental health. And so it really caught me off guard when a few days later she attempted suicide and it was especially hurtful because a few let's say like a, a year before my best friend had just died by suicide and so this person who i was taking care of attempted 
suicide. And we had a conversation where we were like, okay, this is becoming too much. And I think that we are going to have to do something about it. The only conclusion that we could come up with was to break up at that time. I, I didn't take that conclusion very well because I remember we were having this conversation. We had just left Westgate, the, the art cafe of Westgate. You know, I was walking her home and I remember she was like, I'm gonna, I'm breaking up with you. And I took it badly. I was like, okay, this is what you want to do. Okay. This is your number. This is your WhatsApp block, Instagram block. Uh, this is your email, delete, Snapchat. I still walked her home, like I got her home, but I was not speaking to her. I was a mess, I was crying. And yeah, I had virtually blocked her from every facet of my life. I was like, please give me anything of mine that you have, and I will never, I will never see you again. We've never met since then, but we have spoken before. I do keep tabs on her. She is married right now. She did get married to a Pakistani man. You know, when people are in different spaces in their lives, and you are in a certain space in your life, it doesn't mean that, you know, you can just jump into their lives and be Superman. You know, growing up throughout my school life, uh, high school, even meeting her and meeting people at that time, I would constantly adopt this mentality that I have to be Superman in their life. I have to save them from whatever it is that they're aiming from. And that relationship was a rude wake up call that I cannot be Superman and I, I may not have got like powers to <laughs> defy some cultural expectations. That relationship did cost me some issues in terms of culture because I'm not a bit big on culture. Even my own African culture, I'm not, I'm not, I was, or rather, I wasn't really big on it beforehand. But this, and that relationship really, really drove that point to the point where anyone would mention anything involving culture and be like, ah, uh, no, <laughs> I don't have anything to do with culture. I would hear things like, uh, my uncles or aunts arguing about something that their spouse did that is appropriate to their culture but might might not be appropriate in our culture and I just think that is that is pointless. Like why are we arguing about things that dead people created for us? It did open my eyes up to the other side. I think there are certain aspects of the Pakistani culture that are really beautiful and I for one don't hate it as much. As in I think the the food really <laughs> Pakistani food makes it, uh, makes that experience worse. Because while I was with her, she did introduce me to some food and they were really good. And I really love food. But it did, it did also lead me to a path of looking for what culture meant to me. And after the relationship, one of the first things I did is I went, uh, to Kisi. I'm from, uh, my parents are from Kisi. And I hadn't, I've, I've never been to Kisi ever. I was, that was my first. And I went there and I just wanted to get a feel of what it is, you know, that is so important to people about culture. What it is that was so impactful to her about her culture that she was willing to respect it to that blend. So it led me down for part of discovery. I, you know, I got in touch with, with my roots. I, I even started drinking traditional milk and the, it, it taught me a lot. I became more lenient as a person. Sometimes, some people don't need saving at all. They're doing pretty well on their own. Maybe your priorities and your lifestyle and how you move through life as a space is, is very different from theirs. And I think this is what I was trying to say early on, that we move, we as human beings each move through space differently. And I wish I, understood how she moved through space. I was very, I was very focused on protecting her and, you know, giving her what she lacked. But I didn't look into understanding her and where she came from. The only thing, it's like our entire relationship was, was built off on that trauma bond. You know, it was, 
it was I have to save you from whatever that is because I don't want you to experience what I had to experience, you know. So um let me just say that I have not had a serious relationship since her. I've tried getting into a relationship, but what what it did is it made me look for her in other people. Whenever I'd meet a woman, I would really try to make her fit into the box. I'm gonna give her a name, Z. Every single woman I met, I would try and make them fit into Z style of how Z used to be. But the issue with that is I was having a tough time because not as many people were going through the things that Z was going through, or have the kind of emotional baggage. I actually had a conversation with my therapist one day on this and she was like, do you think you look for brokenness? And it really caught me off guard, you know, that maybe because of what I had gone through in the past, and I'm looking for something comforting and something familiar. Z was something familiar at that point, to be honest, because she could understand, she could relate. But with other people, I would have that trouble relating to their issues or then relating to my issues. And the, I know it sounds wrong, but the only way I could put it is the other women I saw after her were not broken enough. And that realization actually made me sit back and think about about my life, you know. Like, why is it that I have to, you know, constantly look for broken people? And there's a lot of power in familiarity. I'm a person who, if, I, if, if, a, if a certain place gave me a certain emotion, then I, I would like to, and if that's a positive emotion, I'd spend a lot of my time there. If you gave me a negative emotion, then I wouldn't want to be there at all. An example of this is a few months back, I was really craving, like, okay, not craving, but I really felt like going to my childhood home. So, um, when we first came back to Kenya, because we were living abroad, we were living in Westland, and I tracked down the place, I went. It was so strange, because I went to the house, I locked the door, and the people opened, and they were like, ah, how can we help you? I was like, ah, I grew up in this house as a child. <laughs> they were looking at me like, what is wrong with you? But yeah, I, I, I think as human beings, we all look for things that are familiar to us. So I had to look at, look at this and tell myself, you know, like, this is a pattern that you have to break. And truthfully speaking, I, I am in that, I am in the process of breaking that pattern. I can't say that I'm fully done with it because often, more often than not, when I meet a person, and I'm like, we're starting to click. Uh, it's even like subconscious. Like, I start asking myself, like, what, what is this about this person that I am so attracted to? And more often than not, they'll just have something traumatic that happens to them. And I'm not saying having something traumatic happen to you is a bad thing. Well, it's not a good thing, but it's not like a bad thing that you have trauma. But what I mean is, I feel like your familiarity is starting to cause issues or uh, take you back in your progress. Is it really worth it? Because I found with every single, with every single step I'd move forward from uh, my relationship with her, and I meet a woman with a similar trauma bond, I would always go back to the state I was. And I wasn't very self-aware back then where I could say, okay, this was what was causing this. I would just jump in. Because I'm an all in, all out, all, all out guy. I can't do something 50 50. And if I end up liking someone, I end up liking someone. Kabisa, Yemi, Ile, that. <laughs> we can start talking about our future after being two weeks into a relationship. So, yeah, it shaped me that way. I haven't had a, like a serious long term relationship since her, but I am, I am growing and I look forward to my to my first one when I'm eventually in a space where I'm able to not look for familiarity. I regularly go for therapy. I meet my therapist uh, twice a month. But on my own, something that I do is journaling. I love journaling. I love processing. On my phone, I have a timer between 8.30 and 9 p.m. It's processing time. So like what happened 
day. You know, sometimes you might meet a person or you might interact with someone and it leaves you feeling very strange and bizarre. So I like I like processing because it helps me uncover why I might have reacted that way or why I do, you know, certain things. Uh, processing really helps because, like for example, there was a time she just randomly called me and she was like, I'd like to speak to you and and that uh, she felt comfortable sharing some things with me. And I did listen to her, but the entire conversation and the entire time, it left me feeling uh, a, a type of way, not because she said anything wrong, but right now I'm more aware of, you know, the chemistry between myself and her. And I think it's especially important to be cognizant of our chemistries between different people, because um, this chemistry, that you know, like energy, they ultimately guide who we allow into our circle. And if you are very keen, you can almost tell some issues beforehand. As in, there was some like the story I just gave. I don't know. To me, right now, having a gun pointed at me should have been a gigantic red flag. Like, I shouldn't have just, you know, up and be like, whatever. It was a real gun. There were all of them had guns. And I just brushed it off. Like, you know, whatever. And the, the things that she would do, the, the, let's say the cheating or the hard regularly getting drunk and then coming home and cleaning insults, they should have they should have really shown me those red flags. But the thing is, I didn't see them because I was not processing them. I only had one agenda and it was to save her. And yeah, if I processed, I would probably would have actually succeeded in my agenda. But uh, the universe didn't have it that way. And so that's actually, I can say it always boils down to processing. And also, I can't remember the name my therapist gave it, but she called it something compassion-based therapy. And she was like, you know, you have to get into a space where you are able to be compassionate to yourself. So I have these little moments when either I sleep back, because it does happen. Sometimes you just want that comfort, you know, and I just have to remind myself that, you know, it's okay. And what you can take home now is a lesson because you've slipped back. Okay, you understand more your life. So now what can I do differently next time so I don't end up, you know, in a space like this? Yeah, compassion could be, any, I give myself self-hugs. Like if I'm having a tough day or something is just triggering, I just hug myself and I'm like, yeah, it will get better. Or dancing. I, <laughs> I'm not a good dancer. I don't dance in front of anyone ever. But if I'm alone in my room and I just turn on Banner Boy or something, I'll be dancing for a very long time. Culture is a part of our lives. We can't really escape it. I tried running away from culture for a long time and I realized I can't outrun it. So what I'd say, in, in the space of relationships, culture definitely plays a part. And just as you make sure you know you have compatibility, just make sure you also have cultural compatibility. I'm not saying this to, you know, reward people off from having interracial, you know, relationships. Because, yeah, I've seen that those, you know, that those that work. I have family members who are interracial relationships. But I think understanding the culture and the space that someone has allocated to their culture. For some people, culture is not a very big part of their life. And you can easily, you know, maneuver that. But for others, it's a huge part of their lives. And it has mega influence on it. So, yeah, I'd say on that side of things, compatibility is important. Like, there's some things you're just going to have to get used to if you're going to want to go through it, you know, a relationship or a marriage or something. Uh, for myself, I'm in a space where I'm very receptive to new cultures. I'm receptive to new cultures, especially if the culture has amazing food. I... I'm a food lover. I'm in a space where I'm constantly embracing new cultures. I love listening to music from different parts of the world. Currently, I'm on a Tunisia music binge. Yeah, and I'd love to visit the country one day and just experience their culture as well. 
while I did have a negative experience with culture one or many times, I I think culture is ultimately a beautiful thing because it it shows you an innate part of who these people are. And I think being able to feel human beings at a start, at that innate level is a special thing. Catch more African stories in the next episode of Legally Clueless. I'm so thankful to Adrian for just being so vulnerable and so open about things that he's experienced about that particular relationship as well. Man, having a gun pulled on you, that is, I don't even know what the word is. I don't know what I would do if I was in that situation. Cops being called. Ah, that is hectic. And you know, I always find it so weird, especially because I'm married to to somebody of a different culture. So Fal is Kenyan, but of Indian descent. You know, the culture and the religion he's been brought up in is very different from mine. But the funny thing is, I find more similarities than differences, both in our upbringing, but also in just our way of life. And we found a way to coexist. So yes, I was raised Catholic. I don't really think I'm religious anymore i'm more spiritual can't tell you the last time i went to church outside of the occasional wedding or funeral so yeah we we understand that we each need our space to do the things that give us fuel so be it my burning of incense and stuff which by the way is not so odd for him because in his mom's faith they do that very often so him and his friends are not at all shocked by my burnings of things like if they come home and the house is just like full of frankincense (laughs) or I'm like saging the entire house that's not something that is strange for them and for him we've just found I I normally don't like sharing his lived experiences or his story that's his to share but we found a way to coexist and in Finding that we've learned that there are more similarities than differences between us. I think it's been so important for us to be on the same page because you will have external forces that don't understand how is somebody of Indian descent with a black African. Trust me, especially when we were first dating, we got that a lot from strangers and people we know alike. We've had instances where someone he knew refused to greet me because <laughs> I'm black and and tell that guy owed him money. Okay, let me tell you, people who owe you money normally have the audacity of like a thousand people. <laughs> We've also had an instance where a stranger, so a black Kenyan man who none of us knew, walked up to Fal and was like insulting him and claiming that, I'm trying to translate it from Kiswahili, but basically saying, you didn't find any Indian women, now you've come to take ours. Which I found so strange because I'm like, sir, you're a stranger. (laughs) Who you be? (laughs) Yeah, so and that that happened a lot during our dating period. But I think what happened is we just made sure we were both on the same page. His parents also protect us from anyone who would have very problematic ways of thinking. So we've not interacted with weird people since, but I'm pretty sure these people who we don't know. Actually, I'm pretty sure about that because we still get the stares. <laughs> But you know, Kenyans stare. So <laughs> it could be my shots that they're looking at. I don't know. But when we're together, we do get those like, you can just see people are like, Ay, what's happening here? So we've, we've seen our fair share of weirdos, but never had guns pulled <laughs> on me or on him or police. So unfortunately, because that is a reality for so many other people who are dating somebody outside their race. Trust me, I've heard of these stories. We've had it pretty easy going. We know of people who have been like excommunicated from their families. I find it very strange. Strange because the similarities, like we focus on all of four major differences, but the similarities are wild. And then also imagine love is love. 
it, it just is. I don't know why we complicate it, but it's the world we're in, right? So if just like Adrian, you want to share a story on this podcast, all you have to do is record a one minute story demo. Um, just tell me a bit about the story that you want to share and then send it to the hotline number using WhatsApp. The hotline is plus 254-768-628-790. I'm thinking of changing the way I will be getting the story demos, but for now, let's just use that until I've figured that out. It's also the space that you can send any messages. If you hear something on the podcast that you completely relate with or you have some thoughts to add on about, send me an audio note about it as well. I just started listening to your podcast today and I'm already at episode 12. And I just wanted to say like, when I woke up this morning, I was like, I had really low, low moods. Like I didn't even have the energy to do anything. Like I'm a student. I've been having a hard time, especially since uh, I've not been able to get a job for a while now. Like when I started school, I had to quit my job so that I could be able to continue the school. But I've not been able to find a job since then. It's like almost two years now. So like on most days, <laughs> I feel like I'm just depressed. I don't want to do anything. I have assignments. I wake up, I decide I'm not even going to do the assignments because I can't even get out of bed. So I just wanted to say thank you because the podcast is really helping me. I had to get out of bed today so that I can listen to the podcast as I do my assignments. And I'm almost done. So... Thank you. Thank you so much for sending that message and welcome to the tribe first and foremost. And I'm so glad that this podcast has become like a, a source of peace and calm for you. So I'm glad that you found something to give you that because that's so important. I'm really sending all my love and I'm really hoping that your job hunt yields some results. I'm trying to refrain from sharing what works for me because like if it's journaling, etc, etc, what works for me might not work for the next person. But I think what's most important to you is finding that job. So I hope that yields results. I'm just glad that this podcast podcast can bring a sense of peace and calm which which it seems to be doing for you i'm glad i'm really glad welcome to the tribe and remember there are new episodes every single monday for the audio episodes and then on fridays you get a video episode that i'm so proud of it's our latest addition to the podcast so in the description of this episode there's a link to our youtube channel that's where the video episodes go out on you can also catch this podcast on trace radio if you are in kenya so it plays on mondays and wednesdays at 12 noon and 7 p.m and on fridays at 12 noon head over to traceradio.co.ke for a list of all of the frequencies for wherever you are in Kenya. If you want to refer it to your family who don't want to stream a podcast, they can listen to it on Trace Radio. Thank you so much for rocking with this podcast, for sending me so much love. Like I really do feel your love and I appreciate it. And there are moments where it's really one of my main sources of fuel. So I'm so thankful. And thanks for showing the video series all the love you've been giving it. I'll catch you in the next episode. That's it for this episode of Legally Clueless. You can share this podcast with your friends. You can keep it for yourself. I'm not judging. Just make sure you're here next week for the next episode.